on our commitment to creating a campus environment that is welcoming, supportive, and conducive to student success across the campuses. Let us embrace the differences that make up our make up our unique and find strength make up our unique and find strength in our shared community. Thank you for being a part today, and thank you for inviting me here today to give an address. And I look forward to learning in our uh, environment where we celebrate diversity, where inclusivity is cherished, and every individual is valued and feel respected. Uh, thank you, and welcome everyone today. I don't think that I am Marianne Sipke. Uh, I am Dr. Kevin Dudley, uh, serve as professor here at Trinity. And uh, first of all, I want to just make some very focused acknowledgement of all of the elders of the African descent community who are here among us. If you count yourself among the elders, would you stand all over this sanctuary that we might honor you in this moment, all of the elders I don't want to go calling names. It goes without saying that we are here because of so many who have gone before us and the very rich legacy upon uh, which we stand also remains with us in a very powerful way. And I'm just so grateful about how God works through the lives of the saints that God puts in our midst. So on behalf of all who are gathered, thank you to those elders who have stood. Uh, do this for me. If you would just turn to somebody next to you, nudge them on the shoulder, shake their hand, give them a great big hug, say, I am so glad to see you. in our pathway. I uh, certainly want to give another acknowledgement to President Kaufman, to Dean Kleinhans, who give excellent leadership both to Capitol and to Trinity Seminary. Can you put your hands together and just bless God for them as well. And for all who serve in uh, leadership around this city, around the state, around the country, certainly Bishop Milton, I acknowledge uh, your presence here again. Thank you for what God is doing in your life in giving leadership to this church. Now, uh, we have to make a bit of a pivot. Uh, everything seems to be okay, all right, uh, but Dr. Bridgman was in a, a slight accident and is delayed a bit. She's okay, but on the way. Uh, so I'm killing time up here. <laughs> right? and, I can think of no better thing to do to kill time than to enter into a period of prayer. I certainly want to pray for her safe passage uh, here as well. So reach out if you're not ashamed, grab the hand of somebody next to you. If you would bow your heads with me, every eye is closed, every heart is praying even now, and we do avail ourselves to the spirit of the living God who chooses to abide with us. Our gracious and loving God, how truly grateful we are that you have looked upon us with favor 
every day of our lives, every moment that we take a breath. It's only because of your goodness. The great gift that you have afforded us, first of all, just to be alive, but also to be alive in this place we dare not take for granted. For these cherished moments that you allow us to share together, God, we ask you to just be present here in a powerful way. We're not sure everything that you will choose to do, but even beyond the prescribed program, beyond the activities that we have planned, by the power of your spirit, oh God, would you breathe upon this sacred space and upon these, your sacred people. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our lives, but even more, thank you for the great things that you have in store for us. We represent but the remnant of those who have been called by your name. And Lord, we understand and recognize that there is so much that you desire to do in that you might work powerfully through us. And so for that, we give you thanks. For every heart, every mind, every person that is in this place, Lord, we give you thanks. For every journey and every dream, we give you thanks. For everything, Lord, that you have placed within us and upon us to do for you, we give you thanks. And in this moment, we call upon your name, O God, as we consider your servant, Dr. Valerie Bridgman, that you would rest your hands upon her, upon her vehicle, allow her, Lord, to arrive here safely, but even as she makes her way, Lord, would you strengthen her? Would you grant peace upon her? Would you release any fear, any anxiety, any worry, any concern, Lord, that her mind would be clear so that she might speak to us? Thank you, Lord, that you are already preparing our hearts to receive what you have ordained for her to speak. And so we pause in this moment to create space for you to be the God that you are. We confess and we declare that we are your people. We belong to you. We are available to you. And so our prayer, O oh God, is that you would have your way. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for choosing us and for claiming us as your people. Now be pleased and be praised with everything that follows after this moment, for this is our prayer in the mighty and matchless and wonderful name of Jesus, who is the Christ, our living Lord. And every heart did say together, Amen. All right. I yield. I just spoke with Dr. Bridgman a few minutes ago. Um, she told me what time GPS said she would arrive at the seminary. And I said, that's a matter of objective record, but subjectively, how are you? Uh, if you've looked at your program, you know she's talking about the book of Job and about healing. And, and what she said to me was, well, I'll be ready to go, because what I've experienced, that's what I'm talking about anyway. <laughs> Which gives you, uh, I know there, there are a number of people here who know Dr. Bridgman, but for those of you who don't, that gives you a sense of, of her not only as a scholar, but as a, the deep person of faith that she is. So that's good news. The other good news, when I stood up here before, immediately after our musical opening, I said that was just the warm up. So what we have now, to continue to build this wonderful power of the Spirit uh, as we await Dr. Bridgman's safe arrival is more music from our brothers Robert Fleming and Terence Dooley. Amen. Thank you so much, Kit, for this opportunity. Um, you know, I
was going to say something else, but in light of the current events, and as we just prayed, um, I'm glad to know that we have protection yeah. around us at all times. Yeah. Um, just go with me as we go down a little. A few hands here, but what a friend we have in Jesus. Our sins and griefs to bear, and what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer, and oh, what peace we often fall.
the Lord has for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that I grew up in a church where they make you just go with the Lord. Draw with me that says, How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? I will sing, How great, how great is our God? Oh, can we say, How great, how great is our God? Your name is above all names. And your word. 
excited that um, our keynote is here to bless us today. We're excited. We're excited that, that God made sure that she was safe even through the accident. Amen. 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 And God continues to do great things even among us. Dr. Valerie Bridgman is the Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs as well as the Associate Professor of Homiletics and Hebrew Bible at Methodist Theological School of Ohio. She is also the founding president and CEO of Women Preach, Inc., the premier nonprofit organization that brings preachers to full prophetic voice. Dr. Bridgman has been licensed and ordained in ministry since 1977. She's a regular contributor to workingpreacher.org and regularly writes for journal, um, the Journal for Preachers. She currently is completing a commentary on Hosea with Dr. Cheryl Kirk Duggan and will write the commentary on Job, both in the Wisdom um, cos Commentary series. It's something when your speaker writes for the Bible. <laughs> so we will be preaching off of some of the notes that she's put together. You can read the rest of it, but I am so excited to have known her for over 20 years, and she is my mentor sometimes. She is my big sister. She can mother me sometimes as well, and so I'm excited and counted a full pr privilege and honor to introduce in this Trout Lecture Series the Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman. Okay, it's really a Jobian moment because all I saw was the sermon notes. <laughs> uh, but here's the lectures. <laughs> I was like, oh, you might get the sermon now and the lecture later. <laughs> well, grace and peace to each of you from God who loves us all so very much. From Jesus the Christ who saves us and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. I am so thankful to be here. Thank you to the president for um, being here with us and for welcoming me to Dean Kitt um, for the many years <laughs> of our friendship and collegiality for the faculty here at Trinity Lutheran. And for those of you who have joined as students and or um, ministers or just curious folk um, from the community, I am really glad to be here. It is my hope that when I am done over the next few hours that I am with you that our ancestral Egon, Bishop Nelson Trout, the first African American bishop for the ELCA, will be pleased beyond the veil. Uh, I honor the great cloud of witnesses in the church triumphant who also joins us today. I actually believe in the resurrection of, of the body. And for those of us in our flesh and blood lives who seek to live the vows we made or that were made for us in baptism. So thank you all for being here and for welcoming me in here. If I'm still a little shaky from the accident I had come, <laughs> coming up here. So I'm going to do the lecture that I have written and I really want us to have some conversation as well. So I hope you listening, uh, that you will listen to also have a conversation with me. I am glad to see friends, longtime friends, the one that introduced me, uh, Dr. Gibson and uh, Lamont Wells, who, you know, we always get a selfie, so we are due one as soon as, as, soon as I'm done. Um, I'm glad that you are here. Uh, I really am. So the title of this lecture, Arguing with God in a Sermon, Job as a Theologian, allows me to approach some of the work I'm doing as a Romanist biblical scholar and homiletician now in this moment. I am contracted, as you heard, to finish a commentary on Job in the Wisdom series 
for Shala's Press. So I've been looking at and reading the book of Job um, <laughs> down in the land of Oz and questions and struggles for some time now. I know that Job does not show up in the lectionary. I, I'm a lectionary preacher, and as a preacher, I almost always preach the Hebrew Bible text. Um, I almost always preach, uh, and sometimes, it, and I do that because I know those of us who use the lectionary text head toward the gospel reading, and we act like the rest of the Bible doesn't exist. So. Uh, because I'm a Hebrew Bible scholar, I try to demonstrate that we might also preach from the whole text as we, as we know them. And, and truthfully, as I have been looking at the book of Job, I am deeply aware that most of us never look past the prologue, the first three chapters of this book, and maybe over into the last chapter of the book because it is narrative. It is not the theological conundrums that Job lifts up for us and that most of us don't want to think about, uh, me included. So I'm not, I'm just describing, I'm not pointing the finger. Um, maybe sometimes we read Job 38 and 39 where God jerks Job up by the collar and starts saying, where were you when I set the foundation? We like that. We like that God finally speaks. But you have to, re it's literally 30 chapters or more in before God speaks and, and starts saying anything to Job. And can I just say and, say, and answers him in my mind unsatisfactorily. Uh, I'm like, how, how is that an answer? Uh, the answers are full of questions. Now, ain't nobody gonna get struck by lightning but me. Y'all are sitting, <laughs> you're sitting far enough away to not get struck by the lightning if God is gonna hit that way. Uh, but there is this business of questioning God throughout the book. It, it is a book of questions. It is a book of Suffering. It is a book of theological conundrums. The theodicy and theological questions in the book of Job are disarming. They disturb us. It's part of the reason why we don't read the book. Or part of the reason why we identify with one of the three friends that come. Because they are quick to come up with an answer. They believe, um, they believe they know what God is up to. They believe that Job must have done something wrong. Because how else is it that you are suffering? What I want to suggest to us that even if you don't plan to preach from this book, you might find it especially helpful to learn from it so that it moderates and liberates what you say about God, what you say about humans, what you say about the world, about the I Dao relationship, and about good news, even when preaching from one of the books we call gospel. Um, I rarely preach from the New Testament, as I already said, because I am convinced that our job is to wrestle good news from any text that is in front of us, and sometimes to wrestle good news beyond the text. Uh, no matter what the biblical text is that you are reading, and I can say more about that later. I approach this question about arguing with God as a theological proposition, as a womanist biblical theologian, in which I maintain that telling the truth and shaming the devil is a key component to the work that we must do if we believe in the liberation of the whole folk. Or to coin a phrase from Alice Walker's foundational definition of what a womanist is, uh, we are required to love the whole folk. And if we are honest, much of our preaching in the name of saving God's face 
does violence to the folk. So in reading Job, I want to develop a hermeneutical and homiletical lenses. Uh, I want to develop hermeneutical and homiletical lenses for approaching all of these texts. For me, this wisdom novella, which is the genre I believe we are reading here, the book of, of Job is, is a novella, a wisdom novella, gives us an aperture into human struggles, into human sorrow and pain. It, it's the theodicy question that bedevils us and leaves us in this theological conundrum, and I would add, making up stories to bail God out of the Gordian knot the Odyssey proposes. So what's in the background for me is the definition of womanist that Alice Walker provided us in her uh, book in 1983, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. And I'm gonna take a time to read the whole definition so that you can hear it and know that this is kind of background noise as I am reading through the book of Job. And you can ask me anything about why when we get to the Q&A. So her definition, that the word womanist comes from the word womanish, which is the opposite of girlish. That is the opposite of frivolous, irresponsible, not serious. Uh, a womanist is a black feminist or feminist of color. From the black folk expression of mothers to female children, you act in womanish, like a woman. Women refer to outrageous, audacious, courageous, or willful behavior. Wanting to know more and in greater depth than is considered good for one. Interested in grown up doings acting grown up, being grown up, interchangeable with another black folk expression. You're trying to be grown. Responsible, in charge, serious. Also, number two, a woman who loves other women, sexually and or non-sexually, appreciates and prefers women's culture, women's emotional flexibility, values tears as natural counterbalance to laughter values, tears, and women's strength. Sometimes loves individual men, sexually and or non-sexually. Committed to survival and wholeness of entire people, male and female. Not a separatist, except periodically for health. Traditionally a universalist, that is, as in mama, why are we brown, pink, and yellow in our cup? Cousins are white, beige, and black? And the answer, well, you know, the colored race is just like a flower garden with every flower, color flower represented, unquote. Traditionally capable, as in, mama, I'm walking to Canada, and I'm taking you and a bunch of other slaves. Three, loves music, loves dance, loves the moon, loves the spirit, loves love and food and roundness, loves struggle, loves the folk, loves herself regardless. Womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. So my commitments here then are to ask responsible, grown up, outrageous, audacious, courageous, willful questions. Questions that will help us to love the folk. To want to know more than might be considered good for one to know. To break open a space where we may not get the answers we want. We may not get any answers, in fact. But at least we have the courage to ask. And the novella Job allows us these questions and the challenge to ask the question, how do we know God loves us? Recently, I did a, a brief study on the book of Ecclesiastes for a local, not a local church, for a church in Chicago. It's another wisdom book in the Hebrew Bible. And I honed in on the second part of Ecclesiastes 1.13, uh, which says, it is an unhappy business that God has given to humans to be busy with. 
This phrase, and indeed the book, this book, Ecclesiastes, alongside Job, leads us into an honest labyrinth of human emotions, relationships, and experience. If we would tell the truth, we do believe that the human experience is a hard business that God has left in our hands. The wisdom literature of the Hebrew Bible is not limited to the books uh, I'm about to mention, but you can sum up the wisdom traditions in this way. The book of Proverbs, common sense sayings, insists that if you do A, you get B, which is a Deuteronomistic tradition. If this, then that. If you love God, then you'll get this. If you disobey God, then you'll be cursed. You know, the if then of it all. The book of Job says, I did A and got Z. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? What are you talking about? And the book of Ecclesiastes, all of these are, are part of the wisdom tradition. The book of Ecclesiastes says, who knows? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good agnostic book. So this struggle in the, it, it really is. And like that last bit in the book of Ecclesiastes where you see the name of God at the end. You see the name of God at the beginning and at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. The one that I just read to you and the one that was it, um, interposed into the book, we believe, by an editor that says, listen, here the end of the whole matter. Just feel God and keep the commandments. Because all the rest of this trying to understand stuff, mm, you're not going to get it. So the struggle in the wisdom traditions I maintain allow us to be more honest in our preaching. I, I had a homiletician say to me more than once, including the legendary William Mitchell, uh, Henry Mitchell, say, people don't want you to preach your doubts. They need you to preach your faith. Uh, the statement, of course, assumes that doubts and faith can't live in the same space. But in the recesses of our hearts, we know that's not true. We know some of us, having just visited from the disciple called Downing Thomas, that we may not trust the testimony of those other disciples and insist on having the same experience. Which, by the way, I, just an aside, I think Thomas is right. They were not trustworthy. I've been with you dudes for three years. Y'all not trustworthy. I got to see for myself. <laughs> That's probably the last New Testament reference I'm going to make. <laughs> <laughs> but what if we propose a homiletical lens that does not obscure our doubt, our pain, or our questions? What if we do, as Dr. James Henry Harris offers and trend? and transpose the way we get at the preaching moment, as the title of his 2019 uh, book suggests, that we get beyond the tyranny of the text and begin to try to preach the Bible in such a way that we take seriously what people are going through. What if we follow the lead of the book of Job and any other number of books of the Bible, for that matter, and lead with the questions that plague us? This kind of approach might bring uh, us to uh, might bring us to humility, to the humility and commonality that we have with one another, that we do not often express in our preaching. We do not often own up to the fact that we don't know. Fun fact, there are 3,294 questions in the Bible. The novella Job is premised on the question, does Job revere God for nothing? This is what the adversary, uh, we, we have read him as read the adversary who is in the throne room with God as the devil, but literally he's a consigliere. He, he's, he's an adversary who goes about looking and seeing what people are doing and reports back into the throne room and says, listen, and God is bragging, you know the story, 
God is bragging. Have you considered Job? Now, I feel like Mother Teresa. Why are you call my name? <laughs> Let me alone. I was doing fine. Will Job, will we, this is the question, love and serve God when it is not well with our souls? What happens to the hope and heart of a human crushed underneath pain and grief and unremitting sorrow when we cannot fix it with a hallelujah? As one of this biblical scholar, Judith, Judy Fentress Williams notes in her book, Holy Imagination, the adversary's questions are good ones. Can we separate the practice of piety from reward? If we're honest, and I hope we are, we too have this question at times. And in the words of the songs of the Clark sisters, we might find ourselves saying, is my living in vain? I started to sing it, but my, you know. The homiletical lens then is sharpened by this precursor homiletical lens. For feminists and womanists, it is the art of the question. What once was called a hermeneutic of suspicion. The art of not just taking the text or our lives at face value but walking around in the text, seeing and sensing who doesn't have a voice in this text, or who has been wounded and not accounted for. How have we tried to protect God from God's own self? What if God doesn't look good in the text? For example, in the book of Job, we like to skip over um, Job's and his wife's pain. We actually like the text where Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But that literally doesn't account for how he got there. The Septuagint gives us much more of the words of Job's wife. I don't list them here, but, but it is, it is necessary for us to remember that Job isn't the only one who lost things or children. And we often celebrate chapter 42 where Job and his wife have more children, they get more cattle, they get, they re, they get their house back that was burned down. And it is the fallacy of a theology of replacement. That thing we do when we tell parents who've lost a child in utero or stillborn by saying some asinine thing like, you can have another one. Or the Lord needed a flower in his garden. How violent as if that lost child could be replaced. So this theology of replacement um, is a fallacy, but we see it not just in the book of Job, but in the way we talk about our own lives, because we don't know how to sit in grief. I have known rainbow children. Rainbow children are children who are born after a miscarriage, and, and some of those have felt this struggle of being the replacement child. And the child that the parent is supposed to be comforted by because they lost another child. And if you are a rainbow child or you've had rainbow children, nothing has feel that space, that loss, it's not helpful. It is present in the book of Job, but it's not helpful. And I am suggesting that as we read, as we think with Job, both with the things that we agree with him about and the things that we, we can say, mm, I, I can't get with you on that, that we can take that also to other texts. This book allows us a map 
to how to get there. So a friend of mine, say, a pastor friend of mine says to me that she thinks Job is as wrong as his friends. Now, if you, if you read the book of Job, you'll know the three friends all come up with the odysseys and why this is happening to Job. And I'm not going to go into all that today. I'm, I may go a little bit further into it tomorrow. But they, they do this whole, Job, you're trying to hold God to account, and we're not going to let you. And Job, of course, is screaming at God. Uh, and aside, it reminds me of the movie The Prophet. Uh, I don't know if you all ever saw that. It's an old movie. I suggest it to you. But in, in the movie, um, oh, now, the, now the actor escapes me. But he, he is, huh? Tommy Jones. Was it Tommy Jones? He, he, he's, he's yelling at God. He, is, he has walked away from his faith and walked away from his call, but he, but he, and he's at his mother's house, and he's in the, he's in the, on the second floor, and he finally says, I'm mad at you, God. I love you, but I'm mad at you. And the mother is down in the bed, smiling with the Bible across her chest, because she recognizes that for what it is. Honest relationship before God. So my friend who says that she believes Job is as wrong as his friends, and maybe she's right. Although in the novella, the deity says to Job's friends, my wrath is kindled against you and against your other friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, Job says some pretty rough stuff about God. I'm just saying. And, and at the end, we're defending God, and God is defending Job. In other words, Job was right. I want to encourage you then to read the book of Job and to focus in on the words of Job. They are not pretty. They are indicting and angry and hopeless. In other words, they are human. And tomorrow I'll dig in a little bit further. But I hope I've given you something to think about as we go into tonight and tomorrow. Thank you. And I deliberately took only 25 minutes for the lecture so I could have some time to interact with you uh, about what I've said. So I don't know if there are mics standing up somewhere or if you have questions, comments for me, I'm willing to address them. I actually think the sermon that I'm preaching tonight is longer than the lecture was, but there you go. And I'm preaching out of the book of Job's for those of you who are thinking about not coming back. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know. Any questions, comments? Uh, go for it, I can't see. Because I have my reading glasses on. Go for it. Right. Right. So, as I understand the question, how do you get past the hopelessness to a place of hope? Right. So, as you're reading the Lament Psalms, the Lamentations, the Book of Lamentations, I'll say something about this in the sermon. As you're reading Job, underneath it is this notion of hope. That is to say, I don't know what God is up to. I cannot comprehend this in this moment. Nobody's going to ever make me understand the, the accident I had before I 
got here today, right? Um, I'll, I don't want to give the sermon all the way, way away, but, um, but like the rabbis who put God on trial and then worshiped, that's how you get there. You go through it. I, I think because we try so much to tamp it down instead of go through it, my mother would say it this way, if it doesn't come out straight, it's going to come out crooked. So we find ourselves going off on people, behaving badly, all of that, because we're really angry with God. Wow. And we don't have the energy or the courage to say that out loud. When, when the pandemic started, I, I did a lot of walking, I still, I walk a lot, uh, and I spent my time saying, God, do you love us? Because um, John Lewis is dead, but this person is still alive. I had a hit list for God that God did not take. I'm just, you know, I did, I had a hit list, because I was like, how are these people dying? How are these amazing people dying, God? And these people are still alive. So I won't tell you who was on my hit list. But I did have one that God didn't take. But it's the, it's the level of honesty where you are really saying, it's not like God doesn't know what you're thinking anyway. Where you're really being honest enough so that you can walk through to faith. Right? So that you can get back to the no, 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 of course, of course not. Because what they say is up the road. I, I don't know that I like the, 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 I mean, it's an unsatisfactory answer too, is eternal life. What does that mean? Except for the eternal life we live on this plane, for me. Okay. Other questions? Yes. And how she was sort of not a good actor. But I've also heard that she's not necessarily a bad actor and that we get that wrong sometimes. Can you unpack that a bit, please? Right. I, so I, mm, I, I, you know, everybody writes about Job's wife. And she's like most women in the Bible. She doesn't have a name. I'm not going to call her Jobella. <laughs> or Cruella. Neither of those. I mean, one of the best sermons I ever heard on her, I heard at, at Mount Olivet with um, Dr. Renita Williams talking about the fact that we dismiss her pain. Yeah, if you say Job lost however many children, 10 children or seven children, they all lost, and you, and, and you focus on Job lost those kids. Job ain't carrying no baby for nine months. I, you know, and, and it's a very interesting text because the rabbis argue about whether she says curse God and die or bless God and die. It's, it's, they are not, they argue about that. There are different texts about that. And, and because we know people who've been suicidal or felt hopeless, I, I can feel her. You know, we use her as a foil and frankly, so does the novella use her as a foil, because in chapter 42, when they name the three daughters, you still don't know who had them babies. I mean, it's, it's still, she's not a full enough character for us to demonize her. We don't know enough about her to demonize her. And I would say that about other people's lives too. We think we know what we're looking at in people's lives and we don't, right? You know, I, I, I'll say it another way. A lot of times we think people are successful and they are. 
by our standards of success, but we don't know what people have gone through to get to where they are. So envy is a wasted emotion. Because <laughs> you're envying somebody and you have to want what they went through as well. I promise you, you don't want my life. And I got a good life. <laughs> but yeah, that would be my answer about her. We don't know enough about her to really say a lot about her. And I'm, as I'm working on this commentary, that's all people want to talk about. It's very weird to me. It's like, there are 42 chapters. She is li literally in three verses. So that tells me more about our fear of the Odyssey and our need to protect God than it does about the novella itself. Um, my rabbi, when I was in uh, Memphis, would say it this way, that when there are um, two Jews in a room arguing, there are three opinions. <laughs> and what he meant by that is, is for the Jewish tradition, asking questions and arguing with God is faithfulness. But because we have grown up in a tradition, we, by we now I mean Christians, however we grew up, whichever tradition of the Christian tradition we grew up, many of us grew up hearing, you can't question God. Right? And anybody who did question God, you know, we demonized them. They had demon or they were rebellious, or they were, and, and they literally was doing what Job was doing, or what Habakkuk did, or any number of people in the biblical text. 3,247 questions. So, thank you for that question, though. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for what you've shared so far. Um, so I was really interested in what you said about our discomfort in the in-between and Holy, and Holy Saturday it stuck out to me because that I have also had that complaint. Um, how, as a preacher, do you approach without like, my, I think my concern is how do I make sure that I'm not like taking away what hope is there and still have like orient people toward a comfort with question, grief, sorrow, Mm -hmm. um, where's that about? Like, how, what right. do you think? I'm actually going to say something about that in the sermon tonight. But oh, I can wait. No, no. I, I, no, it's a good question. So the question is, how do you allow people their humanness without, because we are preachers, right? We're supposed to be preaching hope, and hopefully the, quote, hope of Christ. Um, you know, the, the biblical text, is it Second Corinthians? Y'all, my brain won't pull it up. We grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Is that Second Corinthians or first? Somebody tell me. Anyway, um, but we grieve, and what I'm suggesting is, is that we, we do grief like we do Holy Saturday. We ignore it, or we try to get past it really quickly. We don't want to, we think hope will never come back. We think if you start crying, you will never stop crying. And that to do so means that you will never get your hope again. And I am suggesting that Job is telling us, let people go through the full range of that emotion. And I don't like his friends. I'll be real honest about that. But be the kind of friend that holds that, right? Uh, e even if, if that means, I, I, I always think about Fred Craddock who says, if you live long enough, you will lose your faith. And the role of the community of the church is to hold your faith until you get it back. Now, my mother would say it like this, if you hadn't lost it yet, keep living. <laughs> Just keep living. And, 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 and many of us, and this is true particularly in black traditions, people will say, fake it till you make it. I'm suggesting don't fake it. And you'll make it. 
don't fake it. You make it. Because in the end, Job ends up saying about God that God knows the way he takes. And that he knows God lives. Even while he's saying to God, you won't show your face to me because you know I'm right. Can you imagine? Job said the only reason you ain't showing up, God, is you know I'm right. Show your face. Defend yourself. Right? Um, that's relational. That's, that's, that's not um, transactional faith with God. That's not, if I be good, then God will cheat me right. That we have a relationship, and we're going to talk this out. And in fact, it's funny to me that in the, in the whirlwind speech that we all quote and know, uh, well, maybe you don't know it, but that we read and have her read, um, at the end, Job, Job's like, okay, I'm just going to shut my mouth. I see that as sarcasm. He's like, clearly, I wanted you to show your face, and this is your answer? Really? This is all you got, God? I knew you were powerful and creator, and I knew that. That's what you got for me? That's relationship is what I'm saying. Any other questions or comments? Yes. He's running with the, with the mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, what stuck out to me in the lecture is the fact that in spite of what Job went through, um, God didn't speak into, in the narrative until chapter 30, um, as you said. So uh, what does that say? Um, what does God's delay response, or does it say uh, anything to us about the way we perceive uh, when he chooses to speak in our situations today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you take the novel, novella seriously, it's a human book, right? It's in our Bible, and it's a human book. Just like the book of Ecclesiastes, just like the book of Esther, where we have very little sense of the God that is, we presume, is underneath these texts, right? Um, what I am, when I point that out, what I am saying is this. We experience God in our daily living with each other, in the living of our days. Um, and honestly, I'm of, a, I'm of a certain age now. Honestly, there are things I can look back now and say, oh, that's where God was. But in the moment, in verse 29, moment, I couldn't have said God was in that, or God was present, or God, I, I, not because I didn't believe in God, but I couldn't have pinpointed the places where God was. You know what I'm trying to say here? Looking back sometimes, we can say, oh, yeah, that conversation had the fingerprints of God all over it, right? But in the moment, you know, um, my, I, I have a friend who had a pretty bad accident, and she said, oh, the scripture says, in all things give thanks. I rolled my eyes with her um, as she was saying it, and so she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give God thanks for this accident. I was like, let's figure out what you're going to actually give God thanks for, <laughs> right? And so she said, well, scripture says in all things. So I was like, okay, I'm going to be here with you. Um, about two years later, the company of the truck that hit her uh, settled the suit that her insurance had, um, had um, filed on her behalf. And she got an amazing uh, settlement 
and not only paid all her bills and all this, this doesn't always happen, I'm so, but, so this is an exception. And um, she said, I think this is a part of the all things give thanks. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I mean, when Don Staley said uncommon favor the other day and everybody on the, and broke the internet because people's theology just went crazy. It's like, how dare she say uncommon favor? But as a friend of mine said, that's because we think favor means favoritism. And that's because we have no space for God to move even in our struggles and in our pain. But if we look back over our life and think things over, we can see the hand of God in some of the places where we were struggling. Can we not? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my answer to the 30 <laughs> chapters before. It, it's looking back that you can see, yeah, where God is. Anybody else? Have we chewed all the fat out of that? <laughs> okay, I'll see y'all later. Thank you so very much for your attention. Just a few things. We're going to be inviting you to go downstairs to Kononia, and our meal tonight is being provided by a Judy creation, so we express gratitude for them for their service. We have been natured with, nurtured, excuse me, and fed and nourished by uh, the music and by the word, and now we're gonna be nourished with uh, some physical food. Um, also, during our time at the meal, we're going to be talking about the season of Jubilee conversation. And so before we head uh, to uh, this uh, meal that has been provided for us, let us have a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Good and gracious God, we are so full in this moment of your grace and your love for us. As we listen to hymns and songs and praises to you, as we hear your word and how it applies to our lives and how it strengthens us. And now we come to you to thank you for our physical nourishment, the food that has been provided. We thank you for those who have provided it, for those who have grown it. And Father, now we ask you to bless us who eat it. May this food be nourishment to our bodies, that we may be the servants that you have called us to be in your community and in your world. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.